Hey guys, it's me Kim. It has been a minute since I have sat down and recorded a video for you where you could see me. I'm doing a lot more voiceover videos now. They're just easier for me to record. They're easier for me to get out. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of the content that I make, be sure to subscribe to the For Harriet YouTube channel. The link will be down below. Um, and I am sitting here recording this video because it's been a minute since I've really dug into some feminist theory, you know? It's been a second since I've been on my, my theory shit, so let's go ahead. <laughs> it's so much cussing. Let's go ahead and, uh, let's dig into what do we do when women are the abusers? So one of the most important innovations of contemporary feminism or what's called intersectional feminism, but is really black feminism that's transposed onto contemporary feminism, is a really thorough reckoning with power, what it is and how it operates. If your understanding of power is not rigorous, right, if you're not really digging in deep enough, then it's really easy to rely on conservative ideas about gender, for example, like men are good, women are bad, and that's it. So what do I mean by conservative? So one of my primary critiques of second wave feminism, or at least the white kind of second wave feminism, is that it relies on this gender essentialism that borders on biological determinism. So while we as feminists say women don't have to be mothers, all of us are not naturally maternal or nurturing, sometimes we can fall back into language that's like, men are violent, that's who they are. So I am most moved by the theory of gender essentialism outlined by Catherine Witt in her book, The physics of gender. It's more of a social gender essentialism uh, and less of an ethical gender essentialism, right? So we are all socialized into being certain ways. The social part is important. So are men bad or are they socialized to prioritize dominance via violence in an imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy? Now those things sound like the same thing and they're kind of similar, but they're not the same. So let's talk about why. So we're all socialized that way. Women are more likely to be censured for attempts to reclaim power from people who have more privilege than we do. But everybody in this society is censured for any attempt to upset the status quo. These power imbalances want to be baked into our society. But there are certain avenues in which women are encouraged to be domineering. And parenting is a great example. Women who beat their children or punish them in ways that are harsh or even sometimes abusive are often celebrated because we feel like that's your responsibility. Your children are yours. And because we celebrate mothers in particular, because that's who we expect to do the child rearing, because we celebrate them being domineering and dominating, we give children little opportunity to think for themselves or express their feelings. So let's take, for example, the Baltimore mom. Do y'all remember her? She was a woman caught on tape beating her son after he was out at a protest following the, the killing of Freddie Gray by Baltimore police. So she was out here, you know, beating him upside the head and people celebrated her, right? She was doing the right thing. She was getting her kid in order. And look, I have no desire to berate this woman, no matter how deeply I disagree with that style of parenting. I absolutely acknowledge that that is a response to state violence. What I'm interested in though is how that kind of behavior between a mother and a child is acceptable when it wouldn't be acceptable in any other interpersonal relationship. Why is that? So is abuse abuse or do we live in a society where abuses are encouraged among different people in different spheres, even among the quote unquote fairer sex? It's the latter, you know. It's the latter. So hopefully I've done a little bit to establish that most of us are empowered to be domineering in certain settings. So why are we so drawn to this idea of 
and ethical essentialism. I think because this presumed moral alignment or a fundamental understanding of shared ethics is the foundation for social movement, right? It's That's the gay rights movement, it's women's lib, it's civil rights. We come together with an understanding that we have shared goals and presumably shared ideals. Solidarity is good and I'm not anti-identity politics, I just have concerns about how they're often deployed. So that's why when I think about power, I have to think about it as both contextual and dynamic. The power we have and the power we wield is not static. So famed black feminist theorist Patricia Hill Collins outlined what she calls the matrix of domination in her 1991 book Black Feminist Thought that is a seminal text read it. So there she's saying that your ability to dominate or your experience as the dominated depends on your position within that matrix, right? It's all relative. And no two people in her book Patricia Hill Collins is focusing in on black women, but it's no two people have the exact same social position. And I hope that this is not confusing at all because I've certainly had to do some work to work through how do we balance the fact that people in certain social positions are socialized differently and that can lead to certain behavioral outcomes. How do we balance that with Nobody is inherently one thing. Because I want to balance socialization with a rejection of biological determinism, with an understanding of Patricia Hill Collins' matrix of domination, and the understanding that anybody can be abusive. That part about we can all be abusive, even you, even me, is something we're inclined to trip up on because it's difficult to see yourself as the dominator and that messes up our conversations, right? It makes them difficult to navigate because it's all, it's sticky. But it is something that we have to work through. This is the messiness that we have to wade through because it spills over into our public conversations and it spills over into our activism. After the Golden Globes this year with the Oprah speech and the Me Too and the speeches and the pins and the black dresses and all that, I said to a friend who works in television that I was a little bit concerned about the, the popular Me Too rhetoric because I do think it relies on that conservative rhetoric of men do this, women do this. And even after we acknowledge same-sex perpetrators like Kevin Spacey or Adam Bennett, we fall right back into men do this, women do this. And that stuff does kind of work. We're seeing incredible movement to change and rearrange workplaces to make them more equitable and hospitable for women. That stuff is important. Now, we might ask which women are being most helped by these interventions and if those workplace interventions are actually leading to the sorts of broad structural change that leads to social transformation that we're looking for but i get it you know we all gotta work and nobody wants to be harassed that's important i do think though there are real questions about if corporations corporate boards and universities are the most desirable arbiters of justice. I read a blog post by a woman named Lisa Duggan and she called it the privatization of feminism. And I think there's some, there's a real critique in there about the means of retribution that we are seeking. But we can get into all that another time. My question, of course, is what is it going to take for us to get out of that narrow understanding of power and justice? I really don't know. But I do know that there have been some stories recently that have really intrigued me and kind of pushed my thinking on this. So it turns out that Asia Argento, who was an early supporter of Me Too, she was one of the earliest public accusers of Harvey Weinstein, 
she was accused by a young man of having sex with him when he was 17 and she was 37. There is some proof that that did actually happen. There are photos of her in bed with him and she actually paid him $380,000 so he wouldn't bring a public lawsuit against her. And Argento released a statement via her lawyer saying that he actually attacked her and she declined to press charges and the whole situation had been misconstrued. And while I was mulling that over, I heard about the story of a woman named Avital Ronell. I'm probably mispronouncing that. She is a tenured professor at NYU. A former student of hers said that she harassed him during his tenure at NYU. That she crawled into bed with him and touched him inappropriately and kissed him. And they had to uh, correspond in this way that was excessively florid and borderline sexual and sensual and he filed a title IX claim against her with the university and now he's filing a, an actual lawsuit and NYU actually sided with him. They found that she had behaved inappropriately and she's suspended for a year. I've read quite a bit about those cases. I think both of the women are guilty and that they should face consequences. But feminist women being accused of abuse does not discredit the Me Too movement. In fact, it highlights how if we're really going to make this a thing thing, then we're going to have to go back to that black feminist understanding of what power is and how it works. Because both Argento and Ronell are inarguably victims of sexism and misogyny. Argento we know was sexually assaulted by Harvey Weinstein, I believe her account 100%. Avatel Ronell is a woman scholar in her 60s. Surely she's seen some things in the academy. But those experiences have not stopped them from perpetuating abuses in their own lives. And that's not uncommon at all. Most of us have experienced marginalization or oppression in some form, and most of us will also be the perpetuators of abuse. Now, we won't all be rapists, but there are lots of ways to step on people with less privilege than you do. Now, what do we do with that as people who are trying to create a just world? I think it's a great thing to say that abusers can be man, woman, gender non-conforming, trans, cis, white, black, straight, gay. I think that's really important. And that's not to say that we're all equally bad or we all do an equal amount of damage in the world, right? I am not saying this to provide the people with the most power an escape hatch because that's not real, right? This world is not structured for all of us to be able to do equal damage. The world is still structured so that rich white men get to do enormous amounts of violence and not see any sort of consequences for that. So yeah, we still have to work to make sure that that time is up. But while we're doing the work of leveling playing fields and moving around who's on top, we do still have to do work of rethinking power dynamics. Just putting a woman somewhere ain't gonna fix it. It can't be X group yay and Y group boo because that does not accurately capture the spectrum of what happens in our lives. It doesn't encapsulate the entirety of people's motivations and actions. And that binary thinking of X group is good, Y group is bad, actually encourages us to ignore when the good group does something horrible. It messes up our narrative with the way that the world is supposed to work, so we're more likely to try to ignore it or dismiss it out of hand. And then we make bad identity-based decisions, and then people who are victimized by the good group, their needs go unmet, untended to. So when we're recognizing people's status as both victim and abusers, that encourages to look both at the systems and structures and recognizing that that stuff has to be toppled from the top on down. But it also encourages us to look around us and even at ourselves and look at the way that power operates in our intimate space, in our day-to-day -day lives. In a book called Justice and the Politics of Difference, feminist theorist Iris Marion Young argues that we're not going to get to the world we want by just redistributing power. If we're talking about group A getting a little bit more and group B getting a little bit less, 
that works in the interim and it feels good right now it doesn't work in the long term because as we see over and over again we eventually assimilate into those structures and we have to become dominant to thrive in them we have to really think about how to start over because those of us who are intimately familiar with these abusive oppressive dynamics also become familiar with how to utilize them to our own advantage. We have to think of justice as not just what an individual has, but what a society does. We can be victims and still rely on those same power differentials to get what we want. It's that old Audre Lorde quote again, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. I say all that to say that this is a perfect time to get messy when we're talking about these really complicated power dynamics. We can't always rely on these shorthands. Sometimes that's great to get the message across really quickly. It doesn't always work in our feminist praxis because it might feel futile, but actually this is a site of enormous opportunity when we recognize that gender is just one measure of social stratification. It is not always the most important one. Okay guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. If you appreciate the work that we do here, please sign up to become a patron on our Patreon. There is so much content posted there all of the time, reading lists and articles and books and just stuff that I want to share as well as merch and tickets to events. Thank you. I appreciate it. Or make a one-time donation below. Sign up for our email newsletter. That is all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You made it to the end. <laughs> Bye.